Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. I'm Wade T. Lightheart from the Awesome Health Podcast, and we have a very special guest who has been gracious enough to squeeze some time in between all of her research, all of her presentations, everything that she's doing. She, we were, met up a few months ago, I think it was, when we were, I was on her show, and I was so impressed with her information that I said, we've got to get her on the Awesome Health Podcast. So uh, I want to welcome to the show, Dr. Carolyn Leaf. How are you doing today? I'm doing so well. Thank you. Thanks, Wade, for having me on your show. I'm thrilled. We had a great discussion when you came on my show, so it's great. We, I can see us boomeranging back and forth. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, here's, 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 here's the mind-blowing stuff. I mean, I was looking at your bio. I mean, give us some highlights. Your PhD in communication pathology uh, you're doing neuroscientists or like, just give us a rundown of all this because I can't even go through all this. So it's amazing what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm a um, cognitive a communication pathologist and audiologist and cognitive neuroscientist. And basically what all that means is that I've studied the mind and the mind brain connection and researched how thoughts are real, the science of thoughts, what are they, can we control our mind, etc. And I've done a lot of work in uh, obviously emotional trauma, that kind of thing, but also a huge amount of work in um, education, in learning, in corporate, I train physicians, people with traumatic brain injuries, learning disabilities, uh, the autism, anything where there's a breakdown in communication, which we can track back to how we're thinking, so also Alzheimer's, dementias, um, so it's quite a broad spectrum. I practiced clinically for 25 years. Um, I now basically travel the globe teaching this stuff and I do clinical trials. I write books. Um, I have podcasts and TV shows and so on, helping people to understand how to control their thought life and work with anxiety, depression, OCD, and giving a new narrative to mental illness and mental health, which is seen as a very negative thing. And I give a very different narrative to that, showing people that, you know, it's very much the human condition. We can control our thoughts and we can get through. We've got more resilience than we realize. So there's a, there's a big picture summary. It is, it's a lot. So we'll probably have to have you back more than once just because there's so many different areas that we could go. What I would like to talk about, I think, right off the bat is... So a lot of people are concerned with a couple things, traumatic brain injury or injuries, dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, if you look at the statistics of where this is going with an aging population uh, around the world, what's your thoughts around this? And, and um, it, are, are these the biggest things that you're dealing with, do you think? Like, what do you think is the biggest issues that, we, that we're dealing with today as a, a society, as cognitive health, and, and what can we do about them? Well, that's a good question. It really is. I'd say the biggest problem is not so much the labels of dementia no, and um, mental illness. It, the biggest problem is mind management. So what we had happening about 60 years ago is a complete change in how the human was viewed. And prior to 60 years ago, and this is round about roughly 60 years ago, we the human um, spiritual side of the human, this what we call the non-physical in science, the who you are and, and how you feel about things and your choices and your story and all that kind of stuff was very important in working with people who had any kind of issue. So whether it was trauma or whether it was brain damage from a car accident or a sports injury or um, trauma at birth or whatever, where you are battling in society or battling with your life or whatever, um, Prior to, we, folk, we would focus on helping people learn how to learn and learn how to just kind of work through the process. And then about 60 years ago, that changed. A person's story was, was not considered as important. And what became very important is the symptoms that people were showing. And we became very symptom-driven and diagnostically driven. And things that fell in the camp of therapy, learning therapy, like any, any of the dementias, any of the traumatic brain injuries, any of the things like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is brain damage from um, repeated head injuries, like in sports and so on, any learning disabilities, any dementias, those were all considered to be things you could treat therapeutically. I mean, I say therapeutically, not with medication, but with intervention where you sit and help a person build their brain, get their mind under control. And um, people that were battling with trauma, they were helped. They, it was a different category, but they were also helped therapeutically, intervention, one-on-one, -on -one, personal groups, etc. Then 
that shift changed in around 60 years ago and humans were then seen as biological automatons or robots. And the physical became very important, it became dominant. Um, and it was all about you know, your symptoms and neurobiological matching of your symptoms to the neurobiology of your brain and your genetics. And everything became a big hunt to try and find the underlying genetic cause or neurobiological correlate of mental illness and everything was then lumped under this big umbrella of mental illness when it should it's not actually what it should be called and so anyone who was battling was lumped under mental illness and it was all about uh, diagnose from symptoms forget the story and give medicine and therapy became a sort of adjunct or ignored or whatever and as time has progressed medications have become dominant and when I talk about medications Wade I'm talking about psychotropics Specifically, I'm not anti-medicine for your heart or diabetes. Very important, thank goodness, for the advances. I'm talking about drugs and psychotropic drugs, which are actually not classified as medications. They're classified as anesthetics. Um, and so they are classified as a drug that will numb the brain. And um, so when, you, when they are used, and they were discovered by accident, in the early 50s, and uh, they saw that it had a very calming effect on people that were kind of going crazy um, from whatever trauma or just having psychotic breaks from life or whatever. Um, and they used they, the propramazine was one of the first to be identified. And they saw if you give a certain dose, the person was still awake, but they were calm. And that gave birth to the whole medication uh, movement of, oh, we can actually medicate mental illness. So mental illness can be classified under the same category as heart disease or diabetes or something like that. And that was about 60 years ago. But by the mid 80s, we had Prozac being released and then it was just, it just didn't stop. And to this point where we now face in our current generation, a massive problem where no longer are we in a community forming deep meaningful relationships being allowed to feel, being allowed to be sad or be depressed or be anxious. As soon as you feel sad or depressed or anxious, it becomes a symptom checklist, a diagnosis, a label and medication. And on top of that, we have the self-help industry, which is saying you've got to be happy all the time. So if you're sad, there's something wrong with you and, you know, get those positive affirmations. And if they don't work, it's you. So everything's become about the individual, what's between their head and the story of the individual, the context, the relationship in community, in society that's breaking down. So we see an increase in suicides. We see an increase in shooting. We see an increase in crazy stuff in countries that have adopted this philosophy. This very individualized, it's in your head, you are a biological automaton, it's controlled by your brain, it's genetic, it's this, this, this. Not that they've ever discovered that, it's all just been theory, theory and a lot of billions of dollars and euros that have been thrown at it, but they still haven't found the underlying correlates and they never will because they aren't so that's what i say is the biggest thing so things like dementia alzheimer's those aren't natural things that happen in the brain they come as a result of a combination of lifestyle factors that are preventable and most um severe mind issues are that and that, that very often are linked with diseases like your autoimmune functions and heart disease and that's those are the, the big ones cancers and so on have a lot of origin in mind and now we understand from the up to in the 2000s and then from the mid 90s, we understand that the brain can change. And from the 2000s, it was earlier, but it's been more accepted from the 2000s that your genes can change. And that means that your brain and your genes are not hardwired and you're not a robot with a bad hand, genetic hand or just a bad brain, but you actually, your brain is separate from your mind. Your mind is one thing, your brain is another thing. Your genes and your brain are the physical your body and brain genes, etc. physical, your mind is something else. Your mind works through your brain and your mind is how you respond to life. And you're thinking, feeling, choosing in response to life and your brain responds. So your brain and your body will be affected by whatever signal you put into it because your brain and your body and your genes are responders. They're not generators. Your mind's the generator. Your brain is the responder. And in that sense, if you are experiencing trauma or abuse or you've got a toxic habit that you haven't got under control or you're just never dealing with your stuff, like current society says, you can't feel sad, just numb it. So if you don't process stuff, you're actually causing brain damage because your brain's not designed to just store toxicity and numb it with a medication. It's supposed, you're supposed to get it out, process it, get through it, 
embrace, reconceptualize. So that shift that has occurred has created a mind management problem, which is we see now manifesting in preventable lifestyle diseases. We're seeing that the origin of disease is mind. Um, we've seen suicide increase, all these kind of weird things happening in our societies. So that's kind of a big picture answer. Wow, you, you've unpacked a, a lot of things. And I think it's rare that I would hear uh, someone with the kind of credentials that you have talk about the separation between the physiology and almost this mind as an external area. And I know I'm a big fan of, um, I've looked at some of the early psychiatrists with the Hawkins and Hoffer and Linus Pauling and yes. Carl Jung and that whole era, which we're looking at about collective consciousness. And, exactly, and, and exactly. Creating both on a nutrition lies and then also on a spiritual side. And these exactly. They were attacked quite viciously in the 70s, which was kind of the proliferation of the, of that, yeah. of the pharmaceutical industry. You, you said a couple really profound things in there. Can you explain for our listeners how you've come to the conclusion that there is a separation between your brain and your mind. I think it's something that we kind of know intuitively. It's an observational thing because I say my thoughts or my body or my mm-hmm. physiology. Well, well, who, how am I, who is me saying this is mine? You know, it's always been my question. Exactly, exactly, right? yeah. How, how have you come to that conclusion with your background and your studies and all the work that you're doing? Well, it's a very it's a very ancient concept, and um, you know if you look at the history of medicine and this um, and the philosophy of medicine and the philosophy of science and the history of science, and you look track back a few thousand years up to literally up to three hundred and fifty years ago, that was it wasn't even questioned. You know, we all know about Descartes and the separation of mind and brain, and and then obviously within the in the twentieth century, late nineteenth century, twentieth century, you see. Um, people that have you know done a lot of research showing this, and especially in quantum physics, um, you will see that the the mind and the brain are there's a one of the one of the great ways to explain it is it's called interactive dualism, which it's they interact. You can't have the one without the other. So it's not like you've got you know you are you and you have your brain and your brain is very much attuned to how your mind functions and your mind is this more quantum part of you. It's this sort of more in it's, it's unique to you, but it's also how we connect. It's our non-physical nature and it's 99% of who we are. So a lot of my early work was in trying to understand this non-conscious subconscious conscious, and then the physical action. So um, you, you find that there's a huge um, body of research metaphysical and very hardcore scientists that have won Nobel Prizes showing that as you think, there is a physical response inside the brain. And if you take a brain out of someone's head, it's not going to do anything. So the philosophy that dominates now, that started about 350 years ago, but really peaked 60 years ago and is very dominant now, is that your brain fires, your brain produces your mind as an artifact and it's like a it's like a mistake, which means you're a pre-programmed robot. You have no free will, and that goes so counter to our natural instinct, as you say, my thoughts, and this is how I feel, and this is my perspective, and so we we, we automatically know about our uniqueness and our ability to choose. So it's very instinctive, but the focus on the physical um, has taken away that emphasis on that the person's story and the spiritual. So my research has been, as I said, tracked. The, the history of science, but then also into quantum physics, into neuroscience, into psychoimmunology, and those fields, epigenetics, those fields confirm without a doubt that um, that it is a an interactive separation. So your mind, how I define mind, is it's your the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you choose. Those three things go together. So you're a thinking being. You're always thinking, twenty four seven, and your thinking is unique to you. And thinking always goes with feeling. So 40 times a second on a subconscious level, you are thinking as you think you feel, as you feel you choose. Consciously, you experience that every 10 seconds. On a non-conscious level, it's happening at 400 billion actions per second. So there's this very dynamic um, interaction that's occurring. And it, and it basically, that when you think, feel, and choose, you build a memory. A memory is a thought. And when I say build, 
as you think and feel and choose, you generate energy through the brain. And we see this with EEGs. I'm doing current clinical research. We're using QEEGs. And very soon you'll see our visual images once the, the results are coming through. But you can see from brain technology that when a person is thinking, and they're always thinking, but when you, put, you know, link them up to the, the equipment, you'll see a response in the brain. So um, you'll see a response um, as you, how people are getting, you know, show them like a scary picture or you tell them to think of a sad thing or a happy thing. You know, you see the activity, the response in the brain. What is that response? It's quantum. You see this energy going throughout the brain. You see quantum is difficult to see, but you see a fire in the brain. You see electromagnetic, you see quantum, and you also see genetic activity in response. So genes can't switch themselves on. Genes have to be switched on. And what we see is that your genes are switched on by your mind. So you're thinking, feeling, choosing you, Wade, me, Caroline, the people listening. We are in life and we're getting all these signals, the texts, the emails, the work, the conversations, the things that happen and all that. That is all the signals coming at us. And we receive those signals. We think, feel and choose with our mind. That's our mind in action. And that moves through our brain. So we use our brain. And because that's where we, we cause that the, the action causes a genetic, the, all these signals and it switches the genes on. And when genes are switched on and off, they make things. They make amino acids, which group to form proteins. And I mean, you know this, so I'm just making it super simple. And you grow little quantum neurobiological computers that vibrate and they hold these little, they hold the information. So we're building a thought. Thoughts have got structure. You build them into your brain and then you're using your brain and your body to express yourself. So there's this mind that moves through the brain, causes action, and then we see a physical change. And we can see this from the brain technology. We can see this from the research. Brain technology confirms without a doubt that when someone is thinking, there is a response. And that response creates physical change. And then that, that's a thought. So thoughts are real things. They occupy mental real estate in your brain and on a non-physical level. So every thought you build, has got two is built in built double one on a non physical one in a physical so you're building matter out of your mind you know that's so that whole mind over matter thing it really is real you know and that was always accepted but it's only since we've had this very physical focus and um, that with the scientific method from newton 350 years ago and then the move now towards the kind of science that's practiced where everything's very numerically based you're a number you know very statistic statistical and that's very important. I mean, we do statistics in our research, but it's only one side of the coin. So we're looking at one side of the coin. We've got to look at the other side. You know, so that's what's missing in, in one approach to science. So I come from the other pr approach. Right. So I, I think to summarize that, you would saying what typically we've been focused on is the effect, not necessarily the cause. So we've been tracking. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You're looking very perfect. You're looking at the effect. And they're saying the effect is the cause. And it's interesting because right. researchers that say that, they will they will take a, a, a patient or a subject and they'll put them into an environment and they'll ask them to speak about their trauma and they'll see what's going on in the brain. And they'll say, you see your brain caused, your, caused this. But you've been traumatized because there's a lot of illogic when you actually read the signs. There's no logic because the person's talking about the trauma. That's what they've experienced. And that's trauma. The brain's not designed for trauma. So it will cause a change in the brain. So you can't say the brain caused the trauma because another person caused the trauma, not your brain. Your brain responded. You see what I'm saying? So it's the effect. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheap meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on Masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. You bring up a really good point there, and I think this is 
part of maybe the learning process that we go through or the evolutionary learning in that most of our, let's say, our lower brain cells are built around survival mechanisms. For example, you know, if a bear was coming to eat me or whatever, and I've got to get away from it, that's a pretty traumatic experience. Yeah. And my brain is going to pay attention a little bit more clearly, if, assuming I survive that about there's a bear at some point. Exactly. Yeah. Now, but which is interesting because today, certainly in the modern world or where a lot of the pharmacology or the, the movement away from traditional small communities and passed on generations and, and these deep relationships and these kind of, I would say, metaphysical relationships with uh, both our, our ourselves and our community and where we are in the world, we've kind of gone down this kind of uh, techno-chemical, biological mm, model. world that, you know, I'm looking out my window here and I see these giant buildings and electrical things and ships going and I'm surrounded by massive amounts of waves coming in. I've got yeah. hundreds of emails coming in. How is this maybe a strong emotional impact or strong input response level, which was relatively useful in kind of, I would say, ancient human or even, you know, even 150 years ago, if you look mm -hmm. at the amount of input that we had today, uh, you know, with the advent of electricity and technology and now Wi-Fi and all, all, you know, the list goes on and on. Is part of the challenge today, we are getting so much, what I would say, low level input that we maybe don't know how to regulate as opposed to life threatening or... Yes, for sure. There's a different type, you know, every generation has their challenges and our generation is dealing with um, the great advances in technology and medicine, which have allowed us to, as all the things you've described, we can do all these great things, but it does also mean we, we get a different kind of stimulation. We're not in the, in the wilds with a bear. We're now in the wilds with all the, all the techno, techno world and all the data at our fingertips. And it's changed the way people think. And, and if you don't regulate that, it's, it's a big problem. And it results in changes in thinking patterns and can cause, the, you know, it can be one of the reasons why people feel depression and anxiety, et cetera. And so essentially, we, what we see from the research is that people gather data and you can get data easily. You can, you can Google anything and you can find out anything. And there's all this easy access to incredible amounts of information, which is really fantastic, but you've got to manage it. And that's why I started off by saying we have mind management issues. Mm. And part of mind management is being able to not just gather the pieces of the puzzle, but build the puzzle. So in other words, we need to think deeply about stuff. We're deeply intellectual. So if you're just gathering data and gathering information, it's not going to satisfy who you are as a human. And as a human, you're deeply intellectual, you're deeply spiritual, you're deeply philosophical. It's there, it's in you in different combinations. And we, we, we always you know the deeper things of life. It, some people think about it more than others, but as humans, there's that element, that connection with more than just who we are. We all know that there's not just me here physically, there's, there's something more I'm connected to humanity and all that kind of thing. So essentially what we need, what we find is that people have forgotten how to think deeply, but they gather data, but don't build a puzzle. So one of the things that that could cause is feelings of angst, anxiety, depression, etc. Now with this biological model that we've been talking about, with this emphasis on the physical, we see uh, mental illness as an illness. So people that feel depressed are told they're clinically depressed or they clinically have bipolar depression or they clinically have schizophrenia, they clinically have OCD. So it's, it's a disease. And that's the model that's moved in this biomedical model that's taken dominance since for about 60 years now. And it's you can't do that because the biomedical model works for your heart and for diabetes and for your pancreas and for your immune system, but it certainly doesn't work for the mind. So when someone has depression, we have to look at the fact that that is a symptom, a construct, a big thing of something else that's going on. And that something else that's going on could be information overload, feeling burnt out from the pressure of not actually taking time during your day to just switch off and daydream. You should be taking a few seconds every hour. You should take at least 15 minutes during the day where you just close your eyes, switch off and daydream. I talk about that in my book, Think, Learn, Succeed. People don't do that. You should be building your brain every day. So you should be taking something you're interested in, spending at least an hour 
building your brain and you build your brain with your mind. And that means don't just gather the data, but choose one of those articles, uh, take the book, read it, think about it, understand it, and build effective memory. So building your brain is essential for mental health. And that's part of how we can counter this technological overload. Um, if you don't build your brain every day, you'll have feelings of anxiety and feelings of depression, feelings of, because your brain is not coping. If you don't rest regularly, these little few seconds every hour, 15 minutes a day, you're going to have a problem. And if you don't detox your brain, when I say build your brain, detox your brain, take thinker moments, those are all mind actions. So we choose, we think, feel, and choose to rest our brain every hour. We think, feel, and choose to detox our brain every day for 7 to 16 minutes, which is what the ideal recommended time is. We choose, think, feel, and choose to stop all this data, take a time, take an hour in the day to actually read something, to understand it, to learn it, to build your brain. You know, those are basic skills that have been thrown out the window and um, people are just like overloaded and those are such simple and that's what I teach in all my tools and all my basic um, things is to teach people some real basics again on how to manage in this day and age because we can manage humans evolve so we can evolve but we need to learn how to manage this evolving process that we're in and this evolving life Wow, I just want to listen to you forever. Let's talk about that specific piece that because we don't really have time to go into all these other things, but ma- mind management system. Yes. Someone's like, yes, I feel anxious. I don't know how to keep up with life. I feel like I never get time alone. I'm overwhelmed all the time. I feel anxious. The, the phone's on, the TV's on, the Facebook's on, the social media. How do I take these things? How do I manage my mind? Tell us, doctor, how do we manage okay. your mind so, and like, so in a, the world are we in today? I know, and it's so good that you're asking that because we all, and it's a constant, deliberate, intentional choice. And it's something even me knowing this stuff, I have to make sure that I do this. And so I've built routines into my day based on my clinical research, my years of clinical practice. I still do clinical trials. I'm still doing, if people want to see, they can go to drleafresearch.com and they can find out more. And all my tools are geared to help people mind manage. So how do you do this? First of all, you have to realize like, you know so much about the body and good nutrition from your background. And you know that it's deliberate, it's intentional. People are going to have to take the time to work through using your different, your different types of, of, of um, all the different nutritional supplements and things. You can't just take one and expect it to change. And, you know, all the things we discussed Correct. about your product, you, you've you taught your followers that there's a time process. People get that. It's going to take, with diet, people get it takes time. Exercise, people get it takes time. People don't get it when it comes to the mind. They think there's some instant quick fix. You see, with your body, you can see things immediately. So with nutritional supplementation, diet, and sure. exercise, there's an immediate visual effect. But I can't see something with the mind, so it makes it more difficult. So first thing is we have to get our mindset shifted to realizing I'm going to have to work daily on my mind. Mind management's not a one-off thing. I can't just take a tablet and take it once. I have to, and you can't do that with your supplements either. They don't work unless you continue to take them. The same thing with your mind. It is a lifestyle choice. So you have to choose to recognize that this is going to be hard work every day. I work every day at mind management. Every day I have a routine. Every morning I wake up, I put my mindset on. It takes me 15 to 30 seconds. And that's having these 15 different mindsets. I talk about those in Think, Learn, Succeed. I then go into doing a detox, which is 7 to 16 minutes. It's, we've just released an app called Switch, which is it's on Google Play and iTunes, and it's really cool. We can give it to you for the show notes. Yes, um, and please. that well, teaches I'm, people I'm so mind management. It's super exciting because it's got a lot of these scientific principles in, but done in audio-driven app, 7 to 16 minutes a day, and they can just listen. And it teaches exactly, you've asked me how to do it. That thing really trains you how to do it. So it's all my principles that I teach are going into the app. At the moment, we have the first build has the detox program. And so I do that every day, seven to 16 minutes. And that then starts getting the toxic stuff out of my brain because toxic, your brain's not wired for any kind of trauma or toxic habits. So we need to catch them. We need to embrace the depression, embrace the anxiety, embrace the worry, embrace the sadness. It's a human condition. It's not something weird or odd or illness. It is life. We talked, oh, it's ill, illness, suppress it. We need to embrace it. We need to process it. 
and we need to reconceptualize it. And that's what I do in my detox program. If you don't, your brain keeps toxic substances and you know yourself what a toxic substance will do in your body. Well, that toxic food in your body does, is the same, has the same kind of effect in your brain and your body as a toxic salt. Toxic salts are as real as toxic food yes. and as toxic substances. They're physical and they damage Maybe even brain. more so because even they more lead so. you to take actions or courses or your biology to respond in a way that's very negative. Exactly. So it is more because mind is 99%. So if your mind's not right, the, the, the supplementation that you, you use in your, that you, that you sell, the bio optimizers, they won't work as well unless your mind is right. If you want those op bio optimizers to work, you have to get your mind right or you lose 80% of the effect. And people don't realize that. So you, you have to, you, you have to, you have to detox, you have to self and, and then you have to. And it's a constant, brain. this is a, this is constant. a constant it's because if we're in, a, we're in a, a world where we're stimulated by all these negative things and like goes to likes. So if I'm exactly. stuck in this pattern of thinking, I just keep bringing on more negative. If I'm exactly. And you, you have to learn to self-regulate. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a 63-day process to get you into a self-regulated right. process. Once you're self-regulating, then it's just an ongoing process because we're all going to make wrong choices. We're all going to experience traumas. We all, it's, it's like you, it is, this is life. This is the human condition. We can't control the events and circumstances. But if you are proactive, which is what I teach, is that if you're proactive daily, get the right mindset. Expect good things, not just bad things. And if bad things do come, expect to learn from to them. Out of them. Don't be thrown about them. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways they're learning. You know, so it's just shifting how you, someone's going to hurt you today. Someone's going to make you mad today. You're going to have to forgive them. So just get a forgiveness mindset on. You know, these are very simple things that people don't do, but they're transformative. But it's a daily process. You know, and that's pretty much how you manage your mind. And once you get in, detox takes you, the, the mindset takes honestly 20 seconds to a minute to, to get your mind in the right direction. 15 minutes for detoxing. And somewhere during the day, an hour a day to build your brain. You, instead of getting on Facebook for two hours or whatever, go and read an interesting article and study it and build your brain. And I teach you how to do that in the app and in my books as well. We can send you the links of the books. Please and then, and then as you're doing that as well, build a, few, a couple of seconds in every hour where you just close your eyes and daydream. I mean, just those four things alone will transform your life. And then there's a lot of other things. Wow. I remember uh, Einstein once said uh, he was in front of a group of kids and the kids asked him, how do we be as smart as you? And he said, read more fairy tales. And then someone said, yeah. fairy tales. And they said, well, how do I be smarter than you? And he says, read more fairy tales. <laughs> Get you thinking. Imagination is power. He actually said, imagination is unlimited. Knowledge is limited. Yes. And, and so until you absorb that knowledge and what I'm teaching you, the things that I've said, that teaches you how to absorb knowledge and imagine and grow. And, you know, that's kind of what, with a fairy tale concept, get your imagination going. So um, where do we, first off, uh, I, I'm encouraging everybody, let's go get these books. Uh, you've got Switch on Your Brain. You've got the, um, the Switch AP. You've got the 21-day, like, where do we get all these things? Can you, I know you got to run sure. here, but I'm bringing you back on the podcast. Oh, next next time, I want Pretty more time. Quick. I need more time. Absolutely. You'll, you'll book an hour. I apologize if you've got to rush to the next interview. And yes. I'll need you back on my podcast too. Go to drleaf.com. Yes. Um, and so D-R-L-E-A-F.com. And there you'll see on the store all our different books. I have what I call the Mind Toolbox. There's 17 different books and these videos and DVDs and online programs. That's the best one for people to start. Well, I would start with Think, Learn, Succeed because Think, it's got how to succeed. build your brain. Yep. If, and it's got how to um, manage this technology. The things we've discussed today, the mindsets, there's a great profile in there to help you understand how you uniquely think, feel, and choose. So it's a great start point. And then the Switch app is then totally practical, helping you detox. So those are two great starting points. Um, then we, they can then also read but obviously podcasts and social media and so on. Well, 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 Doctorleaf.com, those are good places to start. Well, before we get on the next one, I know you got to run, but uh, I am definitely going to be doing these, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna come when we come back on next time. I'm gonna say, hey, here's what's been working for me. So, I would um, love to hear that, Doctor Leaf. Cool. I wanted to spend all day with you when you uh, started. This is <laughs> thank you for your fascinating stuff. Uh, thanks for being on the Awesome Health Podcast. Really appreciate it. Folks, check this, check this information out. This is groundbreaking. This is something that's coming from someone who has a background, uh, who is maybe sharing with you something that you might not have heard in our drug-dominant, symptom-dominant, victim-dominant society, 
What a breath of fresh air. Dr. Leaf, thanks for joining us today on the Awesome Health Podcast. Please check out the links uh, and uh, we'll have you back really soon. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Thank you. And by Optimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.